What's poppin' y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Heliocentric Podcast. I'm your host, Pierre, Pee Wee the Plug, Andreessen. For those of you that's watching at home, make sure you hit that like button for me. And if you're new and you enjoy this type of content, make sure you subscribe. For my audio listeners, wherever you get your podcast, head over to that platform right now and leave this podcast a five-star like and review. It is always much appreciated. Real quick before we dive into the NBA topics, I hope everybody is doing well with a bracket. Last week on the Heliocentric, we did an NCAA a tournament bracket video breakdown whatever my bracket is disgusting my bracket is terribly busted um at this point i'm just rooting for good vibes and good basketball because i think that first day i was looking real good but kentucky let me down i had them in a national championship game uh, i don't want to get into too much detail because we probably will in the next day or two do another tournament video i'll probably do something like tournament talk or something where we discuss uh everything that transpired and what went wrong with my bracket and different things like that so be on the lookout for that because i know a lot of people are fiending for the college basketball content and i do have something in store for you guys now for the nba we're getting to a real good spot in the nba i'm not gonna lie we talked about it a little bit on the numbers on the board podcast it feels good as a nba fan to be at this point of the season and there's still a lot on the line so you know the knicks right now my favorite team they're in a battle for that third spot um against the cavaliers and the magic and we got the magic lost to the kings and the heat beat the Cavs. so it's all helping now we just had a really good uh a road west coast road trip where we had we uh, went like what four and one or something like that we lost to the nuggets um so things are heating up Things are really heating up. You got the same thing out west. The Lakers are on a three-game winning streak. I think Denver's on a three-game winning streak. Phoenix might be on a three-game winning streak. Like teams are really putting things together and trying to find their spot um, in the seedings on both sides of the conference. To start this podcast off, the first team that I do want to talk about and discuss when we bring up seeding and recent play, it has to be the Houston Rockets. Houston Rockets are nine and one over their last ten. They've won eight straight. And they now find themselves back into the conversation of potentially being a play-in team. They are a game behind the Golden State Warriors, who I think have lost their last two. And this is starting to get really interesting because the Warriors, for me at least, was a team that I thought were going to be the most scariest team in the second half of the season. And the reason that was was because the first half, Draymond Green was really suspended. And we know how much of a role he plays with this team and their success and everything he brings to them on it, whether it's the defensive end of the basketball, whether it's offensively, Draymond Green just knows this system and the value he brings to them really can't be replaced by anybody. And I felt like them missing that was, was, was one of the reasons they, they had a slow start. Obviously there was guys that weren't playing well. We'll just call it how it is. Um, And there was some other different factors, but I felt like they figured some things out. Steve Kerr really got a handle on the rotation and Draymond Green was back, which gave this team a big boost and they were putting, putting some games together. They was looking real good. So I'm, I'm thinking second half of the year, nobody's going to want to see them. They understand where they at right now. They understand they have to put a run together and it honestly hasn't been that the Warriors have struggled. I think in the last 10 games, they're four and six um, and they're just kind of all over the place. And that in turn has opened up this scenario where the Rockets can really get into this play in as a young, hungry team um, with some sprinkled in veterans. So specifically, Jalen Green, Jalen Green, a guy who I've been critical of this year because I've all I've seen from a distance that the war, the Rockets are a team that they have pieces, right? Every team has a puzzle. It's like a puzzle. You have a bunch of different pieces, and the the tough thing about the puzzle, obviously, just like a puzzle that you're putting together at the the crib, you have to make the pieces fit. The pieces have to go together in order to make one big unit that can have some success as a team. So when I'm looking at the Rockets, I saw that the big piece for me was Alperin Shingun. And I know when when they were drafted and everything, the big piece seemed to be Jalen Green. I was so critical because I'm seeing I'm seeing Shingun spread his wings and become the guy for them. And my mind goes into how is Jalen Green going to allow himself to become a viable piece to fit into that puzzle? Because they got Jabari, who I think fit good in the front court with uh, Shingun. Amin Thompson is a jumbo 
guard wing and they'll figure things out for him because he's only a rookie. Same thing with Cam Whit Whitmore. They brought in veterans who really did their thing on the defensive side of the basketball with Dylan Brooks, Fred Van Vliet. You bring in a defensive mind and coach and he may. So my, my eyes locked in really on Jalen Green. How is he going to respond to the direction that the Rockets are going in, especially with Singoon kind of cementing himself as the guy on his team? And Singoon went down. And it was like, oh, man, that's kind of that's unfortunate. That's sad. Nobody really looked at the Rockets as like this team that we were even considering or fearing. And Jalen Green has answered the call. He's given them 27 points a night right now. Uh, five rebounds, three assists, 51 percent from the field, 41 percent from three, 78 percent from the free throw line during this 10 game stretch. He has looked phenomenal. Um, they're kind of playing a little bit more catered to his style where they're getting up and down. It's a little bit more free flowing, a lot more pace and things like that, which I think is is encouraging to see for him. The only pushback I have against this right now is. Singoon is still Singoon. He still exists. He's still a phenomenal basketball player. How are they or will they mix both of these styles? Because when Singoon was playing, Jalen Green did not look like this, but Singoon looked phenomenal. He was borderline all star. Um, he be he he soared up on a lot of people's rankings as far as the top centers in the league. But Jalen Green was the guy who was hurt the most from that. And if you bring in Singoon again, are you not going to take away from him? And not play to his strengths so Jalen Green could play like this. Because when Jalen Green had everything going his way, you didn't really see the results from a win perspective. So I'm very curious as how they're going to pivot from this situation to be able to have both of them playing at their fullest potential in order for them to be the best version of themselves as they can be. Or, and I hate to put this out here right now, when a guy is as good as Jalen Green has been playing and the success that the Rockets are having, does this open up the door for Jalen Green to be moved in the offseason? Shams this morning gave us the report that at some point in the season around the trade deadline, Houston actually contacted Brooklyn and they put on the table Jalen Green and multiple first round picks in order to bring in Mikael Bridges, which on paper was a phenomenal swap for the Rockets. You go out and you get a three and D guy who has a little bit more to his game offensively, but he's still not ready or is a number one option. But that's okay because you have Sengun, but you bolster up that defense even more. So you have on a wing, uh, Mikael Bridges and Dylan Brooks. You still have Fred Van Vliet there and then Jabari, and then you have Sengun. And then in turn, the Rockets, you get a young, up-and-coming, budding, uh, scoring two-guard, and you get draft capital that you you know, haven't had maybe potentially even get your pick back. I don't, I don't, I don't know if they felt, felt him that valuable to get the pick back because that pick has, um, that pick, that pick has some stock in it. So, um, I'm sorry, you wouldn't be getting your pick back because, or maybe you will be getting your pick back. I'm confusing myself, but anyway, that was the whole ordeal. Jalen green to the nets with a couple of picks and yeah, it would be the Nets pick. The Rockets own the Nets pick. So maybe the Nets, you could potentially get your pick back, depending on where it looks like it's going to be in the stand. I, I, I can't think of where it would be right now. And then the the Rockets would get Mikael Bridges. Because at the time, you're probably looking at Mikael Bridges as one of the hottest topics on the, on the market right now as far as wing play, um, especially with the structure of his contract. So that was an interesting thing that Shams put out today. Um I wonder if I wonder if this play from Jalen Green opens up that can of worms again when it comes in the offseason because the Nets are still going to be a team that is looked at as a mess and they need a, a they need a change in direction very very quickly. I don't know why they continue to sit there and pretend that they have everything in order and that they have the guy. Uh, I like Mikael Bridges. I think Mikael Bridges is a phenomenal basketball player, but I think they're doing him a disservice by trying to put him in a position where he's the number one option. That is just not Mikael Bridges' game and. The direction of the team looks kind of fluky when you continue to try to force that. And now Nicholas Claxton in a free agent market, he could potentially leave. You look at teams like Memphis, OKC, and if you lose him, you really, you really are kind of done for. You're paying Cam Johnson what twenty seven, some twenty five million dollars a year this year. I just saw somebody on Twitter post 
uh, Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo or something like that combined. It's, it's like two salaries on the Knicks that are combined are making less than Cam Johnson. And that, to me, is the, the situation that the Nets are in. Not to make this a Nets conversation, but I just wonder with the play of Jalen Green, with the play he had when Sengun was there, if next year you come back or not even next year. I, I just wonder how do the Rockets feel about it in a long-term lens? Because Sengun is still the guy. As good as Jalen Green is playing right now, the majority of the year has leaned on Sengun. You're in this position to have a stretch like this and catch back up to the Warriors because of the year Sengun had for the majority of the season. I said this on numbers on the board. Listen, I am not one of those people that base everything on stretches. It's, it's very impressive and it's cool when a team or a player has a nice six-game stretch, a seven-game stretch. In this case, this is the best scenario you can get when a team is shrieking off like this. Eight straight games is not anything you should sleep on or not pay attention to. But I, unless you're a rookie or a second-year player, I'm not really a guy that's, that's putting all of my chips on a, on a stretch of games. You know what I mean? Like, oh, my gosh, oh the, the, this guy was averaging six more points in this four-game stretch. It's like, yeah, that's cool. But then if he's only going to go back to his normal ways after that six games, there was really no point in it. Unless it's really drastic like the Jeremy Lin, Lin Sanity run where you got a guy who was barely getting minutes all of a sudden turn into a 20-plus point score and he's a closer and he's making big shots. And Unless it's something like that, then it's like I ain't really batting my eye too hard at that. It's something that I'll acknowledge and it's like, oh, that's cool. That's what's up. He, he's having a nice stretch. But we've seen a lot of people put together runs and, and stretches, and then they go back to themselves and they fizzle out. And it was it was overly blown, or you'll see teams go on a nice little six-game winning streak, and then before you know it, they've lost four out of their last seven. And just like that, that streak was cool, but it doesn't identify who you are as a team or a player completely in the grand scheme of things. So I don't know if the Rockets are going to look at this stretch and feel drastically different about Jalen Green. And if they don't, does this potentially open up the door for you to go out and get better? Because I like Jalen Green, but I am a little, I am a little fearful that this is just one of those stretches that's happening at an incredible time for them to get into the play-in potentially. But I do understand that when Sengun comes back, I'm still putting him at the forefront of what I do and how I'm operating as an offense and as a unit and as a team. And if that's going to allow Jalen Green to then go back to how he was playing for majority of the season with Sengun, then he may just not be a fit here, which is fine. But then I can go and get somebody like Mikael Bridges, who on paper seems to be like a guy who would fit a lot better playing next to Sengun. And then, you know, Brooklyn, you get a look at a guy who you would probably want. To me, if I'm Brooklyn and I'm trying to change the tides and I am going to get rid of um, Mikael Bridges in that friendly contract, I want a guy like Jalen Green. I'm looking at these numbers like, damn, are you? can you come over here and do that with us? Because we don't have a Sengun. You can do this all day, brother. 27-5-3 and three on 51-41. Come over here and do that. We'll, we'll take that in a heartbeat. But, again, I ain't want to really put too much emphasis on that because I know it's hard to, to, to go from being on an eight-game winning streak, nine and one in your last ten, playing for a play-in spot, and just being on fire. And, uh, and the conversation is, uh, uh, are we going to trade you? So to, re, to reshift the focus back to the Rockets, they are 10th in defense right now over this 10-game stretch since March 5th, my birthday. Remember that day. They're 10th in defense. And they're second in offense. So they're top 10 offense, top 10 defense during this stretch. Um, they're only one game back, like I said, against the uh, Golden State Warriors. They're first in points per game. They're averaging 103, 123 points per game during this stretch. They're seventh in three-point percentage. They're knocking down a three-ball at a, at a high clip. They're third fewest in turnovers. So they're not turning the basketball over. Um, they're efficient. They're doing a thing defensively. They are fourth in steal, so they're, getting, they're, they're forcing the, their opponents to turn the ball over. They're getting in transition, getting easy looks, and getting their mojos going. And opponents are only shooting 33.9% from three against them. So they're guarding the three-point line extremely well while then going out and shooting the three ball really well, which I think is a great recipe to win. And then, like I said, you're getting 27 points per game from Jalen Green over this stretch. He's shooting the ball phenomenally. Um, if he was shooting, you got to get them free throws to fall, y'all. 50-49, you, you, you 
78% for the free throw line is cool, but come on, man. 50 49 to get yourself together for this 10 game stretch. But I think the underrated part about this is Fred Van Vliet. Fred Van Vliet is giving you 19 points per game, 10 assists, four rebounds. He's shooting 46% from the field, 47% from three, 90% from the free throw line, um, and giving you two steals a game. Him and Jalen Jalen Green just had a game where they both went off. I forget off the top of my brain who that was against, but they both just went for almost 80 points, I think. Like, just an insane number for this backcourt. They are handling business. They are rolling. Um, over the la- these, these, this last stretch of the season, they have two more games against the Blazers, two more games against the Jazz. They do have some tough opponents. I think they play the Mav twice. They play the, the Thunder. They'll play the Timberwolves. Um, they're going to go against the Warriors again in this stretch one last time. So they are in a spot where it's, it's a little balanced. They're going to have some tough games. I think the next game is against the Thunder, uh, against OK. No, I'm sorry. Their, their next game is against the Blazers or the Jazz. And then they play the Thunder. And then they'll play like the Timberwolves. Um, the last game of the season against the Clippers, I think that could be in their benefit because the Clippers at the last game of the season may be in a spot where they feel like, hey, we are either going to be the fourth seed or the fifth seed because the way they play ain't been super spectacular. And we and we're just cemented. But I think there's a chance at the last game of the season, the Clippers may be set in stone in their seating in the West, and that may be a spot where they decide to rest Harden, rest George, rest Westbrook, rest Kawhi, and that may be a free win for the Rockets, who may really need that game. The Rockets, Warriors, back and forth for this last play-in spot potentially can go down to the last game of the season, and that may be super beneficial for the Rockets to play a team like the Clippers the last game of the year because I can definitely see the Clippers being like, we're in a position where this game don't really matter, and hell, we we, we rather pl- prey on the downfall of the Warriors. I think the, the entire Western Conference, damn near the entire NBA, if they had the means – would definitely help the Rockets make it in the play so the Warriors can miss the, the, the playoffs. I don't think that's a secret at all, especially a team like the Clippers. They're back and forth, and I know that the ownership is different. The players are different. But I think there's just been something there between the Clippers and the Warriors, and I'm not trying to look too deep into it. But again, because it's the Warriors, I, I don't at all doubt that a lot of teams around the NBA, especially Western Conference teams, would would not mind doing any favors to a Rockets team if 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 they had the means to to help them get that get get in over the Warriors. Now I'm not saying the Clippers are going to sit guys in a game where is it's meaningful for them. I don't think they'll do that. I don't think it's that important to them. I don't think that the Rockets are going to play OKC or Minnesota or or the Mavericks and all of those teams are going to be like, well, we're going to rest. I, no, I don't think it's going to go that far. But for the specifically the last game of the season. I think that could be something to, to watch for the Rockets that can end up being beneficial. Um, Draymond Green had an interesting interesting quote when the, the Rockets were brought up last night in his post-game interview after they lost to the Timberwolves. And uh, somebody asked him, are you paying attention to the Rockets at all, watching them doing the streaks because they're getting close to y'all? And he said, oh, no, nah, I don't give a damn about the Rockets. I ain't worried about no damn Rockets. Or something, something along those lines. And, hey, I look at that quote in two different ways. I agree. That's the mindset you should definitely have. The Warriors are in a spot where they have to control what they can control. And they can't control shit that's going on with the Rockets. So from that standpoint, I agree with Draymond. I wouldn't be worried about no damn Rockets either because I don't play for the Rockets and nothing the Rockets are doing I can control until they play us. But. I also feel like this is a team you should watch because of some of the things I said. Their schedule does have some tough opponents, but at the same time, they are streaking. They are playing at a level right now where they are going into these games feeling like they can beat anybody. And even when they play these so-called easy games, they are taking care of business. They are whooping ass. They are beating teams by 30, 20. They getting, the teams that they're supposed to beat, not only are they beating them, they beating them convincingly. They they doing what good teams do. We putting belt to ass against these teams that have no business being in any game. Whether we're not gonna play around with none of our food, we take. So that got me looking at the Rockets different. Not only are you beating the bad teams for sure, 
for sure. They're beating the, the Jazz and the Blazers. And, of course, I, sometimes you look at that and you say, oh, they're supposed to beat them. But I see some teams that struggle with some of these teams on a night-in, night basis. Draymond had a whole speech about the Warriors saying, hey, we don't win games. We should win. You know what I'm saying? Like, we lose games, we should win. And in this league, you have to be able to win games that you're supposed to. And I think a lot of that comes from allowing teams to hang around. There's a lot of teams that just, hey, they go in and it's like, oh, yeah. I just seen the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies just beat somebody recently. You know what I mean? Like, the Grizzlies are the Grizzlies have beaten the Warriors, specifically. The Grizzlies with no jaw, no bang, they have beaten the Warriors on a G.G. Jackson performance. And those are the games that I think come down to the wire for the season. When you look at the Warriors, you say how you end up in this position. It's because of those type of games. And right now, the Rockets are a team that are handling those type of teams. They're handling them convincingly. And that makes me feel like even some of these games that we look at on the schedule and we say, oh, that, that's going to be a tough opponent for them. That's a, that's a tough matchup. The Rockets may win those games. You know what I mean? Like, the Rockets can definitely go in against OKC and beat them. I'm not saying that they will because obviously the OKC is a better team, but but the way the Rockets playing, they can beat them. When they got to go against the Timberwolves, oh, they can beat the Timberwolves. They got two games left against the Mavericks. The way that they playing right now, the confidence they have, they could split that. They could split that matchup. So with Draymond, I think you might you 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 should give a little damn in a certain context about the about the Houston Rockets, especially with the way that y'all are playing. Uh, we can we can talk about the Warriors as well. I got notes on the Warriors. Right now in their last 10, they're 11th in offense. They're 17th defensively. Their net rating is a 2.4. They're giving up 39% from three against opponents. 39%, y'all. Teams are going against the Warriors right now, and they're almost shooting 40% from three a game. They're just going against the Warriors and being like, hey, we're going to let it fly from three, and we're going to win. We're going to win that way. That's 27th. In the entire league, that, that percentage, 39% is 27th. They're near last in guarding a three-point line right now in this 10-game stretch. They're getting a 29 assists per game. That's also 27th. And it's funny because it goes into something that Draymond Green was speaking about at that presser as well, which he was saying that we're, we're a quiet team. You know what I mean? Like, you have to be able to communicate. And you have to talk at some of the, the communication has been poor because we're such a quiet team. And the numbers, the numbers support that from Draymond Green. Like, and I don't even know if he has the numbers, but, you know, I'm not a I'm, I'm a guy that I test and feel I'm over the over the numbers. And Draymond Green the probably don't have the numbers, but he can feel it because he's out there playing. And communication is the number one thing in guarding a three point line. You, you're giving up the three pointers. You're giving up assists. These are stats from a, a defensive standpoint that, that that signals all to communication. All to communication. This is a 10-game stretch. I'm not talking about they just gave up a crazy amount of assists last night. No, this is the past 10 games. So for 10 games, teams have been moving the basketball because moving the basketball signals that is going to generate incredible three-point looks and opportunities because you guys don't communicate at a high enough level to defend those actions. Dribble drive, help, help the helper, help and recover, help and replace. That's all communication. So I'm agreeing with Draymond in that standpoint. I'm agreeing with him in that standpoint. The, the facts line up with his statement on that. And I don't think anytime soon this will turn around if they do not get that that side of the basketball together. The Warriors are never going to have too much of a hard time pl playing uh, or getting buckets with Steph Curry as the engine of that offense. Um, I don't know what's going on with Steve Kerr. Um, he's talking about 30 to 32 minutes for Steph because they've had to ride him for the last 15 years. A lot of people on social media was like, oh, pause, whoa, ride him for the last 15 years. But all in all seriousness, I just don't think you're in that luxury right now. I just don't. Uh, it sounds good. It makes a lot of sense. And if he said that at the beginning of the season, this wouldn't be surprising. But Steve Kerr, y'all are a game above the Rockets for the play-in, brother. You either going for this shit or you not. And if you not, then you might as well fold the deck extremely hard and, and call it one and let the Rockets get in there. 
if that's really what you're thinking. If it's about preserving Steph, why are y'all even going for the playoffs? The play-in is two games for y'all. Even if y'all solidify that 10th spot, you got to play the, the against the ninth seed. If And if you win that, you have to play against the loser of the 7-8 matchup. And if you win that, you ain't doing nothing but going right into the playoffs. I, there is no preserving Steph right now, Steve Kerr. And he's going to play Olympic basketball this summer. There is no preserving Steph. I'm sorry. You cannot have it all. You, you cannot have it all. This is what comes with a dynasty. When you have a dynasty, you're playing a lot of basketball. A lot of mileage goes on the body. This is why we crown LeBron James and we talk about him the way we do. And people always are me glazing and glazing. You got the LeBron dick riders, all these different things. No, it's because LeBron was able to go to nine straight finals, play Olympic basketball, do the all-star games, do all of these different things, and he's still top tier ready for it year in and year out. This is what comes with the territory. And I just think that right now, in the midst of this stretch, where you're four and six in your last 10, the Rockets are on an eight-game winning streak. They're literally on your ass. You just don't have the luxury to be talking about resting Steph, the difference of 30 minutes to 32 from 35. You know what I'm saying? And then you're saying if we lost that game because of two minutes of Steph Curry, um, something is wrong. Like I, he, don't, he don't think that they lose a game because Steph plays two fewer minutes. And then from a standpoint, I agree with that because – yeah, he played. Steph Curry went to the press room and was like, "Yeah, I played more game. I played more minutes against the the other night against whoever they played, and we still lost. And then I didn't play that many minutes against this team, and we still lost this game. So it's about a middle ground. And I kind of agree with Steph on that standpoint because yeah, Kerr has a point. He played a bunch of minutes the other game, and we lost. So now I'm sitting them out this game for fewer minutes, and we still lost. But you have to find something with within that because that recipe just doesn't really make sense." And I think at this point in the season, um, you don't have you just don't have that luxury. And I'm looking at the next next few games for the Warriors in the season. Tomorrow, Tuesday, they play against the Miami Heat. Luckily for them, the Miami Heat just haven't been on shit offensively. They just had a really good win against the Cavaliers, though. And we know how the Heat are. They can they can dirty a game up and make it grimy and gritty and slow down the pace. You know what I mean? Like that's them. Then you play against the Magic. The Magic are a young, fun, hungry team who've been putting together some real, real good victories. Um, then you have kind of like an off night against the Hornets, which, like Draymond said, these are the games you're supposed to handle. So if you go in there and you handle your business and you don't play with your food and you knock them out early, that's a game that Steph shouldn't have to play too many minutes in. The Spurs, they're a team that I think beat the Warriors this year. Hey, if you go and you handle your business against them, Steph don't have to play too many minutes because you're going. it's going to peak up. You have the Mavericks twice. You have the Rockets. You play the Lakers. You play the Pelicans. But you have the Jazz two times. You have the Blazers. So they're kind of like the Rockets where you're going to have some tough opponents, but then you have some ones that are just gimmies. The Hornets is a gimme right now. The Jazz is a gimme right now. I'm talking about like those are games that the Warriors not only have to win, but they should win convincingly. And that will allow their older guys like Steph Curry to not have to play a bunch of minutes. But we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening. We'll see what transpires because here's another stat that I'll leave you with in terms of the Warriors. They have blown 13. 13. And for my audio listeners, there's there's gaps and pauses and me saying that because I'm being dramatic on camera. Like I'm putting my head down. I'm looking distraught. They have 13 12-plus point leads blown this season. And in that 13, they've lost them all. Talk about playing with your food. So so, the, so for, if I said that in a way where you don't understand it, the Warriors have had 13 games this season where they've been winning by 12 or more points and they've blown those games to opponents. And every time they've blown those leads, they have lost. They're 0-13 in all of those games. They lost every single game that they've blown a lead of 12 or more points. They have lost them all. They lost every single one. And again, what Draymond Green talks about, winning games you're supposed to win, that type of stat is alarming. Because when you're up 12-plus points and it's the Warriors, 
you want to win those games. You feel like you should be able to win those. Those are games that you you win. For most other teams, you win those games. The Warriors, though, they're not. They're playing with their food, and then now, now you gotta now you gotta play Steph. Now you gotta feel like you're running them into the ground because you're giving up a lead. And now a team goes on a run, so now as a coach, you got to put them back in and hope that the guy who got you the 12-plus point lead can go now and stop this other team, run, and ultimately win the game, and then you lose. And so all 13 of these games have been a waste of minutes for, for Steph because you know Steve Kerr put him in, put him back in to try to go save the day, and not, it, it wasn't, it's never enough. They lost every single one. So the Warriors got to get it together. I definitely think that they should be worrying about the Rockets. I think the Rockets are playing with house money. The Rockets don't have anything to lose. Shingon is out. That's an excuse for them. They're a young team who, um, to be honest with you, their success was being a much better team, making gradual steps and gradual leaps. Um, And that's what they did. And it wasn't even gradual to me. They've made monumental steps. This team versus how they looked the last few years of their rebuild is totally different. They're a respectable unit and group of guys who is well coached. They compete. They play hard. They bust their ass defensively. They found their guy. Um and they have some intriguing young pieces. A man Thompson is giving you 12, 7, and 2 in that 10 games. 61% from the field. Yeah, he's shooting 17% from three. We're not really going to talk about that. But 61% from a guy who can't make a shot at the perimeter Teams know that, and he's still getting what he wants at the rim at will. Impressive. Cam Whitmore played four games in his 10-game stretch, 15 points per game. You know, Jabari got suspended, him and Chris Dunn trying to duke it out. But I think Jabari has been kind of impressive as well, playing in a whole different role. They starting him at the five these games. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not his normal, typical um, position. You know, not right now in his career. He's still got to bulk up and put on. Uh, more muscle and strength, but he's he's been doing his thing. Jeff Green, Uncle Jeff Green has had some phenomenal gains off the bench for the Rockets. Like, I am paying attention to them if I'm the Warriors. I'm sorry. Jock Landale against the Bulls had like 15 and 12 and 7 or some shit like that or, or 5. Like, just hooping. Just hooping. Dylan Brooks stepping in and going at DeMar DeRozan, defending his teammate Jalen Green. They just got outstanding vibes going on over there, man. Like, they just doing shit across the board that I'm just rocking with. I'll sign me up for the Rockets. I hope they continue the streak. I like the Warriors, too. Uh, it sucks that they would have to miss the playoffs, but 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 I don't care. If they got to miss the playoffs to wake up and get back to their usual selves that we've got accustomed to loving over these past few years, then do it. And I want more drama in the NBA. I, I love player movement. I want to go into the offseason not knowing what's going on. If they miss the playoffs, do they bring Clay back? Do they not? A lot going on. And I, I just want to see some things. Because I, I don't like what's going on sometimes over there. Jonathan Kaminga has been outstanding and been really good. He had to request a trade to get minutes. I know I keep saying that, but it's mind-blowing. Steve Kerr, come on now. Do better. Um, switching gears a little bit. Another Western Conference team that's kind of been eh. A team that I thought was going to be really, really good in the second half of the season, too, after the playoff break, uh, after the All-Star break. And that's the Clippers, man. Um, Dave now putting themselves in a position to where they have a half game lead over the Pelicans, a half game lead over the Pelicans. So we were talking about the Clippers at one point, not that long ago, potentially having a nice second half of the season after all-star and going to fight for that number one seed. Now in, in reality, in the real world, right? They could potentially be a fifth seed and not even have home court advantage. All of that work that they did this year where where a lot of their guys played, they went out and got James Harden Um, after the tough stretch with him. They ended up figuring it out and becoming one of the hottest and best teams in the NBA. All of that just to end up right back here where you're only a half game over the fifth seed and could potentially lose home court advantage in the playoffs, which is something that Ty Lue talked about. Um, at the beginning of the season, he talked about the importance of Kawhi and Paul George being available, how much seeding plays a factor in the playoffs and how they need to take it more serious to have proper seeding. And now who you are, they're one and eight against playoff teams since the All-Star break. Disgusting. They're six and six without Russ. Since Russ is going down in those 12 games, they're six and six. Six and six. Last 10 games, opponents are shooting 42 percent from three, just like just like the Warriors. Just giving up the three ball, giving up the three ball, 15 threes a game over that stretch, which is 27th. 
They're 11th in turnovers force, which is 27. They're allowing teams to get comfortable. They're not turning teams over, which means they're not getting a lot of transition, fast, easy looks. Because that's what happens. You turn teams over, you get you get out in transition, you're getting easy ones, guys are getting going. And now when you get in the half court, you're feeling good. You, you, you busting ass. You know what I'm saying? Like they're 12th offensively and 25th defensively in the last 12 games without Russ. They have a negative uh, 0.8 net rating, which is 16th. 14% turnover rate, which is 19. They're turning the ball over too much, too much. And just from a viewing experience and an optical thing and a thing that we can't really look up in stats or, um, you know what I mean, analytically, I can't look this up, but they're missing Steph. I mean, they're missing Russ. They're, they're, they're missing Russ. It's the leadership shit, man. It's real. Those are the things that don't show up in a box score. The things that people don't really like to talk about with Russ because they rather talk about some of the decision making he has or his turnovers or whatever. But Russell Westbrook is a real leader. And, and, and we're seeing that right here in front of our faces in real time. They have a lot of guys who are kind of fragile on this team, as far as I know and what I see and what I view. I'm a big fan of Paul George, my favorite player in the league. I like Kawhi. I like James Harden. Big fan of the Clippers in general. So I'm not saying anything that'd be disrespectful, but just from what I see and what I know, these are a lot of laid back personalities and guys who have a tendency to be be fragile in certain moments, whether that's physically, mentally, or both. You know what I mean? James Harden has a legacy of not showing up or having his brightest moments in the playoffs. His lowest moments have constantly been in the playoffs when everything is on the line and pressures builds up. James Harden hasn't been the performer that we've seen him be in the regular season. I'm not making that up. That's just a fact. Kawhi Leonard physically has kind of had moments where he's just kind of fragile, where he's not playing through certain things. And I'm not necessarily against it. Because I'm a believer, yeah, if if some shit don't really feel right in my body to the extent that he's dealt with, I probably wouldn't play either. I, I probably would. I don't know. I play through injuries, but some of the shit he's dealt with, I probably wouldn't either. Um, but that's been a topic where he just kind of won't play. And then you have certain guys who, like I said, I, I would play through an injury depending on what it is, depending on the, the, the stakes. You know what I mean? And I'm not, again, it's not blaming him. He doesn't control his body if his knee goes out on him. Shit, I, I don't think Kawhi wants to be hurt, but there has been shit in the past where people say that shit. Kawhi don't mind missing games. And then my guy, Paul George. He is a guy to me, based off what I know and what I see, that is comfortable with deferring. And I don't know if it has anything to do with his injury. I don't know if that's just who he is as a person. You know, some people just defer. Some people just aren't dominant personalities who walk into rooms and say, hey, I'm leading or I'm him or whatever. And that's okay because Paul George is still a phenomenal basketball player who will bust a lot of y'all favorite players' asses. But in the grand scheme of things, sometimes you need that dominant force to be able to say, all right, come on, y'all. We're getting it together. And I think that's that's, that's Russ. And the irony with Russ is that he is willing to hold guys accountable when he is a guy that fucks up a lot. But that that's what you have to have. You can't really care. I think they have a lot of guys who are like, man, let me not say nothing because I'll be fucking up too. But like leadership is 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 not always perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a leader. You just have to be willing to hold people accountable and call people out on their shit. And also don't mind when you're the one that has to be held accountable. And I think Russell Westbrook fits the bill. When Russell Westbrook fucks up, I, I see him be mad at himself a lot too. The same way he would be mad at anybody else. I've never seen Russell Westbrook fuck up and try to act like, oh, it ain't a fuck up. Nah, I've seen Russell Westbrook get animated towards himself plenty of times. And I just think that they need that. I look back at Paul George specifically because he's my favorite player and I I know his career. Even at the top of his game, one of our favorite versions of him was the young Paul George before the injury with with the Pacers. I'm not sure if Paul George is the leader of that team. I think that's more specifically David West and George Hill. As far as commanding a locker room, leading and, and communicating and talking and holding people accountable, I'm not sure that that was Paul George's role on that team. I think he was the best talent and best producing player on that team. So when you go against the Miami Heat, Paul George, yeah, he's the one that's putting up the highlights, putting up the numbers, making big shots. Yeah, it ain't David West dunking on Birdman and dapping up with Braun at half court. That wasn't George Hill. No, 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 no. But I believe in those timeouts, 
when you gotta say let's get going, when you gotta check bullshit, when you gotta tell Lance Stevenson, hey, cut that shit out, man. We in the middle of a series. You blowing the people ear. Come on, man. Don't, don't, don't. Come on. I don't know if that message was necessarily necessarily coming from Paul George. Even the shortcomings in OKC, I kind of, I kind of put a little bit of that blame on Paul George. Those first round exits. I look at the Utah Jazz series where Paul George was struggling. And I remember that closeout game. Russ was giving his all. And Paul George was very passive at the end of that game. Very passive. It was in Utah. I think they had a chance to win that. He was extremely passive because he was having a tough night. I think he was 3 of 12, 3 of 15. And at a certain point, he was getting the ball and he wasn't even looking to score. He was getting the ball and looking straight to Russell Westbrook. And I think that just comes with a little bit of fragileness. Even if that's a word, I think sometimes you have to have some in you that say, I don't give a fuck. I'm struggling, but I am still him. So I'm going to still continue. We're going to live or die with me shooting. I'm not settling for three or 15. There's five more minutes in the game. I'm either going to be seven of 20 while I'm making a few more shots. or I'm, st- I'm just going to be three of 21 while I missed my last six shots as well. We seen that with Dirk. That mentality got Dirk a ring. He was struggling against the Miami Heat. And he could have came out and said, nah, I'm missing. I'm missing. I don't want to continue to dig a hole for myself and embarrass. Nah, it's like, fuck that. Oh, no disrespect, Jason Terry. You cool. You, you, but I'm dirt. So we're going to live and die with this. And I think sometimes that plays a part. That plays a part. They have a lot of guys that just are laid back. They're nice. They defer. And Russell Westbrook isn't that guy. Russell Westbrook has the energy. He has that fierceness. He's competitive at all times. Uh, even if you're a 10-year teammate, if you're on the other side now, it's it's middle fingers to you. And they need that right now. They really, really need that. You watch the Clippers game, the Clippers will come out lackadaisical. Just like, hey, we just here. Then they'll come out and have game. We went to the we we I can't stop talking about it. We went to the Bulls Clippers game and we sat courtside and the Clippers came out and commanded it from the jump. Kawhi and Paul George walked in that court and they whole shit was hey, we them dudes, we run this shit, we better than anybody that y'all have, and that's just what it is. That's just what it is. And then I watched them the very next night against the Pelicans, and they didn't they didn't totally fold, but they just didn't have the same type of same type of swagger. As a as a as a complete team level, some of the guys still came back and hooped and did their thing, but just as a team vibe, it just didn't seem like they was all the way there. You know what I'm saying? And even some of the last games, you just play and they just kind of like, eh, we just today we just chilling, like we ain't we cool today. We on some cool guy shit. So um, I'm looking at the Clippers and I'm watching them and I'm ready for Russell to get back. Russ plays um, tonight, I believe, or the next game they play. The Pelicans are scary, man. Same thing with the Warriors. The way the Warriors should pay attention and look at the Rockets, the the Clippers have to be looking at the Pelicans. Even with the Brandon Ingram injury, you have to be looking at the the Pelicans. Trey Murphy can come in and fill that void for for Brandon Ingram. But Zion Williamson has been phenomenal. Against the Pistons the other day, he had 36, one missed shot. He is playing like the Zion Williamson that they drafted at number one. That's how he's playing. He's on. He's on his shit. He is doing his. He's doing a damn thing. So I'm. I'm loving when I'm getting there. You still got C.J. McCollum. He had a phenomenal game against Miami. Um, like the Pelicans. The Pelicans on paper is like, oh man, they lost Brandon Ingram. That's gonna be a tough injury. But they have so much depth, and they have a little bit of everything. They have an interior score who's a go-to guy. They have perimeter scoring and C.J. McCollum and Trey Murphy the third. I really think people don't grasp or understand how good Trey Murphy the third is. I've been trying to tell people since he came out of the draft. That dude, to me, was the guy in that draft. He was the sleeper. I wanted him to fall to my Knicks. I think they took him right before our pick, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't even understand how that the Grizzlies, I was selling the Grizzlies. Like at 10, I would take him. Even if it feels too early for a lot of people, I didn't think so. And then they went on to take Zaire Williams anywhere, if I'm not mis- anyway, if I'm not mistaken. Trey Murphy was the fucking guy. I cannot stress it enough. Um, they have Herb Jones, the uh, a point of attack defender they got guys like larry nance valentunas who would dirty it up and go to the glass and and, and really bore alvarado comes in and guards nashi naji marshall has moments jordan hawkins when he plays can, can be a sniper the pelicans are the real deal even with brandon ingham hurt you have to pay attention to them and you have to lock in if you're the clippers ty lewis talking about it he's saying man these guys just got to wake up they do 
because I do not believe you want to play against the Pelicans in a series where you're the fifth seed. I just don't think so. The, the Pelicans have played the Clippers good all year long. I would still pick the Clippers in that series, but I would definitely feel like oh, I'm a little shaky about this. I'm not as confident if they are on the road. So they got to get it together. Um, and yeah, the NBA is the, the NBA is just heating up right now. I want to give a shout out to my Knicks. Knicks been playing really, really well. A lot of people talking about Thibodeau and the minutes and different things like that. Listen, man, you have to do what you can do to get wins. We're seven and three in our last ten. We had an incredible uh, road West Coast road trip. Jalen Brunson has been playing phenomenal. He's all NBA. You can sign, sign, steal, and deliver it. That that that's that's all the way through. Defensively, we just been a monstrous team. We are we are locking teams up so bad. It's it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. And I really do do think if we can get up in that top three to end the year, you got to get Tom Thibodeau some some coach of the year love. He might not win the award. Might go to JB or or, or um, Missoula because the, the the Celtics are just head and shoulders above everybody else. Might might go to Dayton at, at OKC. But you got to give some consideration to Thibodeau. You know what I mean? Jamal Mosley might get some love as well. But with the injuries at the time that we got them, the critical injuries, you know, Mitchell Robinson was one thing, but then Julius Randle goes down. OG Ananobi, we trade for it, and he goes down. I'm talking about, like, every everybody has had a, a little a little nick up here and there. Mitchell Robinson is, is practicing, so he's getting closer. But we've just embodied the next man up mentality to a T. McBride has had really good games. Josh, Josh Hart has had really good games. Steven Chenzo has had big nights. Um, Alec Burks in a loss against Denver has had 18. That's really been my biggest thing, the opportunity that comes along with some of these injuries. It can be a blessing in disguise. I do feel like if there's any point in this season in the playoffs where we do get close to full full percentage, you know what I mean? Like I don't know what's going on with Julius Randle, but if we get fully, fully good and fully healthy, because of the time that we had, where well, we had these injuries and a lot of guys was able to get some experience and start to get some 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 rotational minutes. We're going to be really good. A lot of guys are going to be really feeling good, f- feeling good about themselves and have a lot of con- like Deuce McBride is going to have a lot of confidence. Dante DiVincenzo is thriving with confidence. Josh Hart is going to have confidence. Pressure Achua, Achua versus before he came versus now with the Knicks looks like a totally different player. Hardenstein Best backup center in the game. Like, he looks like a, a starter since Mitchell Robinson has been out. He looks like a bona fide starting center in his league. So, um, the minutes don't concern me. A lot of people talking and focusing on the minutes. They don't concern me. I'm happy that 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 it's a blessing in disguise for us and guys are able to get their mojo and get their confidence up. And um, I think it's something that we can parlay into the playoffs. And we just got to really get healthy at this point. Um, I'm trying to think anything else I want to talk about around the league. I don't really think so. Um, a lot of teams out West are kind of figuring it out. So I think OS is going to be a real, real big juggernaut finish, um, to the end of the year. As far as the Eastern conference, the, the Celtics are continuing to kick ass. They trying to go on a 10 game winning streak. The bucks are figuring things out. The bucks. Yeah. Giannis Antetokounmpo is, is fun. Like, I did a little thing with Stadium where I gave them like my MVP candidates, and this is like a week and a half, two weeks ago. And I, maybe people don't watch basketball, and they just wasn't keeping up. And I had my top three MVP candidates, and, and Giannis was on it. And people was like, "Man, no, it should be Luca. It should be Luca. It should be Luca." And Luca is having a really good year, but just based off this the scenarios and the fact that the Mavericks are eighth right now, the Bucks are they're second in the East after the start that they had to the season. They switched coaches. They're comfortably second right now. And Giannis has been putting his team on his back on certain d- different nights. Chris Middleton has is, is, is been in and out of the lineup. He's starting to get back healthy right now at the perfect time. He's been playing really well. Damian Lillard was having stretches where he wasn't looking like Damian Lillard. And they were still able to get the job done. And that was a big byproduct of Giannis Antetokounmpo. So the fact that y'all don't have him on y'all MVP ballots is crazy. And top three, and this is one of his best years. You know what I'm saying? If we being completely honest... This is one of Giannis' best years, and it's just not getting talked about because a lot of shit has overshadowed the things that have been going on in Milwaukee, which I understand. They're headlining news, firing a coach while you have one of the best records in the NBA is not the typical thing, and it's going to dominate the storyline. Adding Damian Lillard and losing Drew Holiday dominate the the storylines. Is Giannis frustrated or unhappy dominating the headlines? But they have been a really good team. They're figuring things out slowly but surely. 
And when you have Giannis Antetokounmpo, when you have Damian Lillard on your team, in any given series, you're going to have a good chance of winning, no matter how bad the defense can look at times, because it is super concerning to have Malik Beasley and Damian Lillard as your backcourt defense. I get it. I've been very critical of the defense, but it has gotten better. And who is really going to stop Giannis? And anybody that has the ability to stop Giannis probably means that you don't have the ability to stop Dame. Like the Celtics. I look at the Celtics, and when I see them, I'm worried for Dame because you have Derek White, Drew Holiday, Jalen, and both of the both of the JBs. I mean, both of the Jays. But on the interior, you're extremely vulnerable for Giannis out in the coupon. Porzingis don't want the, that problem, and that's my dog. But you don't want that problem with Giannis. Al Horford, that's too much responsibility. Al Horford... He can still move his feet, and he'll have games. He just had a nice really game against the Bulls recently, I think it was. But I don't think in a seven-game series you want him to really have the Giannis assignment. No. And when Chris Middleton's starting to get back into the flow of things, the the, the Bucks don't sleep. Don't 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 sleep on the Bucks. And yes, Giannis Giannis should have real MVP consideration. It'll probably go to Jokic for the third time, and you you obviously got to shout out Shea. You're going to acknowledge Luca, but I think just acting like Giannis don't belong in that conversation is 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 ludicrous. Um, they they're peaking up and heating up at the right time, and um, I, yeah, they're just not a team that I personally would sleep on. So, um, with that being said, it's a wrap for the Heliocentric podcast. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Like I said, we are going to have some more bracket NCAA tournament content going on. In the next day or here, so make sure you're locked in on the PB to Plug YouTube channel. Um, if you're new or you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. Want to give a special thank you to all my audio listeners um, who continue to to show love and show support there. I see the reviews, I see the likes, I see the 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 support. It is always much appreciated. And yeah, man, we are getting down to that fi- that final line. We're we're a couple of weeks away that fast of the NBA regular season being over. Um, and make sure y'all stay locked in to the Numbers on the Board podcast. Um, we got some exciting news coming soon over there. And, uh, yeah, just be on the lookout. I've been doing some work recently with the stadium, uh, which is a another sports company and establishment. I've been doing uh, a lot of different shows over there. Some of y'all have been seeing me, um, not on purpose, just coincidental, flipping through the TV or whatever. And y'all have been seeing me. I've been getting a lot of love from that. So, um, yeah, make sure you tune in to, what, to everything that I'm doing over there inside the association. Um, the clubhouse, the rally. I've done some shit with Shams, my guy. So yeah, lock lock in. And um, I guess I will see y'all next week. As always, y'all be cool. This is uh, the Heliocentric Podcast. I am Pierre, Pee Wee the Plug, Andreessen. I'll see y'all next time. I'm out. Peace.